Lord Jesus give you his peace. This morning in the Gospel of St. Mark, we have the call to be perfect in love and the twofold commandment of charity that Jesus spells out to the scribe who asks and then ratifies that answer of our Lord with his own understanding and is approved by our Lord that you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. In the first reading from Hosea, we hear in chapter 14 to return to the Lord. And if we have collapsed because of our guilt, we are to return to the Lord with words. Take with you words. And then this great promise of healing. And it gets at the heart of Lent of repentance, which is something also we heard in the gospel acclamation today. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if we note in Hosea 14, there's two turnings or there's two returnings. And with those two returnings, we can kind of think of St. Mary Magdalene also in St. Um, John's Gospel, chapter 20. There's two turnings when she encounters our risen Lord. Uh, she turns herself back and saw Jesus standing, and she knew not that it was Jesus with that first turning. And then later on in that same chapter, Jesus says to her, Mary. And she turning says to him, Rabboni, which means master, teacher. And it's those two turnings that perhaps this morning we can consider in light of the twofold commandment of charity to shed a bit of light on the demands that charity has in our lives. And the first turning, if we think of, for example, the um, Council of Trent, and absolutely inspired by the Holy Spirit, it's teaching on justification, how we uh, are made righteous in Christ by turning away from evil and turning towards the good, and the capital G, good, who is God. And so in that light, uh, with charity towards God, now, of course, charity we can define as you know, love of God and uh, love of neighbor uh, as ourselves for God's sake. And, and just in the words of the gospel, above every other thing, above every other thing. And so with love of God, that first turning, we want to oust a couple things from the soul. Um, and those, those two things would be idols, and the second would be anger. And the first has to get to has to uh, deal with the Lord, and the second has to deal with neighbor. Those perhaps are the two major categories. And we hear it in the first reading of Hosea that, you know, Ephraim, and depending upon the translation, what do I have any more to do with idols? And there's lots of levels to that idolatry in the soul, <clears throat> because even when the big for example, the big conversion comes in one's life and, uh, you know, I gave up drinking and great, great, great. And my life's brand new. Great, great, great. Yeah, and it's the beginning. And it is great. And it's a miracle. And it's the beginning of a very, very deep journey within the human heart, which will eventually, by God's grace, which we are called to, lead to the transforming union, which is the very, in the passive purification of the soul prior to that, that the very roots of those sins, which are, very deep. <clears throat> Jeremiah, more tortuous than all else is the human heart. <clears throat> it's eventually something that we can't work out on our own. And those idols, so to speak, uh, often work themselves out, even if it's not sinful, but all, even in desire. In desire. And they're so it's kind of like, you know, just like in the springtime, if you're going to be weeding in the garden, whoop, it's coming up again, and you've got to get that thing out of there. And to recognize that, especially any predominant ones. <clears throat> and to pray especially that uh, while those things still exist in the human heart, we know that we have lots of work to do. And we might consider St. Therese especially, it would seem to be that her act of oblation to merciful love was something of almost an act of reparation specific to this passive purification. Her basic stance was, I've got no righteousness of my own. And every, you know, righteousness that I do have is stained in your eyes. And that's the disposition that eventually we, we come to, we must come to. And this passive purification, casting out idols. Okay. So the second turning or the second ousting, the first turning, but the second part of it is ousting anger. And speaking of Ephraim, St. Ephraim in his um, expounding on this first commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your might, according as you are able. And the sign that you love God is this, that you love your neighbor. And if you hate your neighbor, 
Your hatred is towards God. This is his homily on admonition and repentance. For it is blasphemy, he writes, if you pray before God while you are wroth, for your heart also convicts you that in vain you multiply words. Your conscience rightly judges that in your prayers you profit not. Christ, as he hung on the height of the tree, interceded for his murderers. And you, who are dust, the son of clay, rage fills you at its will. You keep anger against your brother, and do you get yet dare to pray? Leave off rage and then pray. Unless you would further provoke, so shall you supplicate. And then he has got some good counsel in terms of <clears throat> with this disposition, the irascible appetite revolving around justice um, and the, basically the, the difficult good eventually. Um, if we have that, turn it towards its proper objects. For example, yesterday we looked at Beelzebub and he says, if you would be angry, be angry with the wicked and it will become thee. If it's to wage war that you seek, lo, Satan is your adversary. If you desire to revile against the demons, display your curses. A good friend of the community uh, at times goes out to pray before like uh, different psychic shops in Rhode Island, right? And he takes out his miraculous medal, St. Benedict medal, holy water, blessed salt. He prays, and thanks be to God, to the glory of God, a couple of closed. And at one time in prayer, so this great cold hatred, the sheer hatred came over him in his presence. He kind of shuddered. And he, says, and he kind of got a good sense of him. He says, well, the feeling's mutual. <laughs> the feeling's mutual in terms of uh, our hatred is towards sin. And the source of that sin is uh, certainly Satan. So those things are proper outlets in terms of uh, those, those dispositions. So the, the bottom line would be this in terms of angered towards our neighbor is Romans 5, 8. God proves his charity towards us because when as yet we were sinners, Christ died for us. It's not like we're all this, you know, shining virtues while all this is going on. This is when we're at the, the very bottom of the slope, so to speak. Okay, so uh, now let's turn outward and love of God, uh, specifically towards love of neighbor, focusing on that. Now, if we think of love of God, um, the, the aspect that we can take into perhaps our meditation is the crucified Christ because that will be, in the thought of the saints, the very stripping down of all the pride and all the idolatry of self, essentially, that will, that's at the root at all these uh, fallen tendencies. So a quick look at that. And then to the love of neighbor, and St. Therese is very strong with this. She says, while we're on this earth, there's nothing more important than love of neighbor because that's the measure of our love of God. That's the index. The catechism also has some very powerful words in that same vein. Blessed Giles uh, nails it for us. Uh, a friar asked, Brother Giles, what does the prophet mean when he says every friend will walk deceitfully? That's Jeremiah 9. Giles responded, I cheat you in this. I do not make my very own of your good. The more I would make your benefit mine, the less I would deceive you. The more a person enjoys his neighbor's advantage, the more he enters into it. And so if you wish to share all men's well-being, rejoice at their good fortune. Consequently, if you really see another's good as a fine thing, make your own of it. Be concerned about your neighbor's misfortunes if you really see them as evils. This is the pathway to salvation. Rejoice over your fellow man's good. Afflict yourself with his misfortunes. Make much of others. Make little of yourself. And so he nails it in terms of this is the disposition in terms of love of neighbor. It's true compassionating, true love. Mother Mary gives us the icon of this love. She receives the privilege of beyond all other privileges with um, becoming the Holy Theotokos, the mother of God, and then completely realizing what she had pledged to the angel. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. I am the slave of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to your word. And then she's off in service to her cousin Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth. And her whole life is service. And so too it must be for us as well. It's just the service of charity. Okay. Now, as we turn towards neighbor, one thing that we must, of course, expect is suffering because... Just as we are fallen, so too are they fallen. But let's keep in mind St. Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, for the children should not save up for the parents, 
but the parents for the children. But I will most gladly spend and be spent myself for your souls, even though loving you more, I be loved less. So that's some, a dynamic we should be comfortable with, or to at least expect that in that fami familiarity that breeds contempt, that is at least one side of love, uh, not to be deterred by that, because it's very part, much part of the redempt redemptive aspect of the love that means to save. Mother Mary, if we interpret her name as Mariam, bitter sea, uh, is about this kenosis of charity, drinking the dregs of suffering. And if what that bitterness in terms of in light of charity would be is not that just a love is not requited, but that love is actually seen as something that's evil. And that's a bitter drag to drink. But at the same time, in the vilification of love, there's also life to be had. There's also the the complete turnaround that we began uh, in considering this morning in Hosea of the return to the Lord if you have collapsed through your guilt. And we too have our part to play in that plan of salvation.